Uh, thank you. I'll, uh, my name's Mark Garrett and I'm part of Furberfield, uh, which is going for, since 1996, which is, we've been exploring art, technology and social change. And I'm gonna be showing you a little bit about where we come from as an art group, but also move into stuff around how artists are exploring uh, artificial intelligence as part of their medium. And, uh, and it's very much about how, uh, how to curate art with technology as well, because uh, it's a specific approach because you really have to kind of learn about the technology uh, rather than just show it. So like for me, I come from a coding and hacking background, but I also am an artist as well. But as many people know, when you run a gallery or we've built our own stuff online, as I'll show you as well, years ago with communities. Uh, so this gives you an idea of us in the park in Finsbury Park. So the Furfield Gallery is in the heart of Finsbury Park. Uh, less than 10 minutes from the tube, it's actually probably about four minutes from the tube, and uh, the National Railway stations, uh, roughly 55,000 people uh, per week use the park that we're in, uh, which sits at the borders of three different London boroughs. Uh, so that's Harringay, Islington, and Hackney. So, so if you can so it's kind of in the centre of a very busy crossroads culturally. Uh, there's nearly 200 languages spoken locally by a large migrant community and the park itself is 150 years old. Uh, so we produce and promote playful, translocal, co-creational uh, models and research experiences. We foster critical art, art that thinks, and rather than art that doesn't think, and technology, and a lot of that will be involved in the critiquing and challenging the technology that you use rather than just using it. Uh, therefore, it creates really interesting debates around the context of the art that's being used with the technology. Uh, we work with the commons, uh, so a free and open source commons and open source technologies, uh, which is very much about making uh, a lot of the work that we use is much more accessible to uh, people rather than just uh, that's hidden behind a kind of paywall. And just let you see some of this stuff. Uh, we have all kinds of events. We don't just show in the gallery because we've got a park. So we use the park for loads of stuff going on. We've got a common space, which is where people do talks and we have events there. And then we've got the gallery, but we kind of have events there as well. But also we have events in the actual park as well. And uh, lots of stuff going on. And, and this is basically uh, the curatorial statement because uh, that I'm going to just read out a little bit because it's very much about uh, where we come from, how we curate as, uh, and our relationship with the community and technology. So we strive to create context for translocal and planetary scale engagements with art and technology cultures. This comes with a, a do it with others ethos. Uh, which is uh, a progression of DIY so, and the spirit of punk. And so it's like, obviously with punk, it's like pick up your guitar, you can make your own band. In a way, pick up a gallery and you can create your own exhibition and pick up technology and you can make your own art. And it, it, it's from that ethos. So in other words, it's, there's a kind of breaking down of hierarchy uh, so we co-produce exhibitions with an intersectional approach and commission works that reveal that technology is neither innocent nor neutral. Nevertheless, those excluded from shaping the design of technologies must have a say about its effects on them, their communities and the planet. 
we present and commission artworks by people from various backgrounds and classes, both established and emerging practitioners. We have a hybrid approach with exhibitions and projects, allowing arts, uh, tech, culture and society to be part of its context, whilst acknowledging uh, uh, FOSS, which is like free and open source software, as part of an ecological awareness of technology and its issues and artistic contexts. We look beyond the already established art market because it does not indicate what is relevant to today's society. We choose to build on new territories of cultural production through online debates, research workshops, and labs with artists, academics, and technologists. We take art to unexpected places so that it may be experienced by people who might otherwise think that it's not for them. Uh, thus reaching more people who wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to experience uh, the critical imagination of the work presented. Uh, that makes it quite easy, where, which is why we chose to go to Finsbury Park, because you've got much more of a diverse group of different people who have access to the work that we're doing and it, uh, it, it's, it, you're just going to get a lot more people coming to see the work. Uh, so, but what I wanted to do is building grassroots cultural art context. I'm going to talk about a bit of that that's in the 90s. Uh, I started in late 80s, early 90s with technology and hacking and pirate radio and all kinds of stuff. Uh, with different friends in Bristol, in, in the UK. And then uh, and I'm going to show you some publishing critiques about arts and technology that uh, we, myself and others that I work with, have been involved in. And then I'm going to show you some curatorial, uh, critical perspectives, uh, which kind of uh, argues around uh, extractive systems around AI technology. Uh, so, whoop. So this is in 91, where we hacked. Uh, that's, that belonged to Tesco's, and it's, so it's a digital board, and we, with our little tiny computer, we hacked into it and created our own billboard over the top of an advertisement. And uh, this is our, one of our exhibitions, but it was in a subway, and where people would come along and you, you see those big square floppy disks that shows how old we were, or I am now, uh, where people can bring their own art on those floppy disks that go into that computer that we've got in the actual uh, space. Water. And it was great fun. Loads of people used to come and visit our, our shows inside the subway. Uh, uh, and it was all word of mouth, so the police couldn't find out. And loads of people just come along, have performance parties, and put their own artwork up and, uh, in, in our special gallery that we claimed ourselves. And uh, uh, she's quite a famous, quite well-known performer now, but that was when she's with lots of, uh, yeah, anyway. And uh, street art, so as I, said we're involved with people like Massive Attack, Portishead, Head, On New Sound and different groups and also Banksy in the early, late 80s, early 90s, very much part of our culture and uh, this is, uh, we used to have pipe radio but we used to use names that are already there uh, like EMI, uh, but we called it electromagnetic installation for the pipe radio. And, uh, and, and we used to create our own transmitters and, uh, and borrow some as well. And so the pipe radio station ran for 18 months, uh, broadcast into Greater Bristol every weekend. We changed our location for each broadcast and disseminated this information and confused the authorities tasked with destroying us. We used a home-built 20-watt stereo FM transmitter and an antenna, 
uh, all submitted material was provided on audio tape broadcast regardless of quality and quantity. And so loads of people locally will be, uh, including the bands that I mentioned before, will be submitting all their material because a lot of them weren't that well known then and uh, doing poetry performances on the, on the pipe radio because there was nowhere for them to be heard. Uh, the local radio was just pop music, you know, from the top of the pops. And we weren't interested in that. We were interested in uh, uh, creating our own noise in a way, our own, our own spirits. And uh, so we, the only way to do it was to hack your way and do it. Uh, that's why we learned technology. And this is analog technology, so it's broadcasting in analog. Uh, we finally had to close down because of surveillance. Uh, we got caught twice. Um, and, uh, uh, but it was very exciting. We used to go to all different venues and we used to have live, we used to have live broadcasting at different parties as well. It was a very grassroots and uh, peer building process. And in a way that's where do it with others started in uh, the philosophy uh, because DIY is very much do it yourself it's a singular activity but doing it with others is much more expansive and more about co-creation uh, we've built our own online platforms on the internet as well so as you can see the left one is uh, is Twitter uh, and we worked with a group called GNU Social that have been involved with, uh, what can I say, uh, Mastodon and some other groups that are more well known now. But at that time, they were in Canada. GNU Social is, uh, still is a free and open source software uh, group uh, that's doing amazing stuff. But we worked with them uh, to test out some of their platforms and we designed them around our own audience because we've got a very large audience online. That's one key thing actually I should mention is that we've got a massive audience online that's grown with us since 1996 of artists that use the internet from then and we've got different groups like email groups and so in other words it's a big community that's just thriving all the time uh, anyway. So what's so interesting, it's just grown independently and we didn't really need to be justified by any external sources. So that's what's quite interesting. So this got populated by some of the community and different people on the right side. And that's kind of uh, uh, an early version of what Mastodon is now, but it's a better version, much more easier to use. Uh, because you actually had a community that was working on earlier on. But anyway, but we decided uh, the community voted not to use it in the end, which was quite annoying, because it's a, it's a consensus community that we work with. Uh, I'm just going to talk about some of the publications we've been involved with. This is a publication that I was involved with called Artists Rethinking the Blockchain. Now, some of you may be aware of what the blockchain is. I'm not going to completely explain it because that'll take another half hour but uh, I'm just going to mention a little bit here so the blockchain is widely heralded as the new internet another dimension in an ever faster uh, and more powerful interlocking of ideas actions and values the blockchain is a ledger distributed across many machines enabling digital ownership and exchange without a central authority uh, within the arts it has profound implications as both a means of organising and distributing material as a new subject and medium for artistic exploration. And a, a, an easy example of that is NFTs. We were working with that before anyone else. And some of, and some of the people we've worked with are now selling their work via Sotheby's through NFTs and getting quite known through it, although we're not but we're not bothered by that sort of stuff. So, and also what's so nice if you work with people that get known is they feed back into your community and fund some of your projects. So it's quite an interesting co-relationship that we go, because the community looks after its, its story, so to speak. 
its history. The landmark publication brings together diverse artists and researchers engaged with the blockchain, unpacking, critiquing and marking its arrival on the cultural landscape for a broad readership across the arts and humanities. So a lot of the main universities now across the world are using this as their main standing block with artists and technology and the blockchain and AI. And, uh, and this one was the first one uh, which we got there and which is interesting. And we had to learn the, the technology was brand new to us at the time as well. So we had to learn the technology to write about it, find where the artists are and the techies that are using the technology as well. So it's also a really interesting research project in its own right. Uh, so among the contributors, you know, people like Heath Hostel, who's quite well known now, Rachel O'Dwyer, Rhea Myers is quite well known now as well. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, just one of the publications. This is another publication called State Machines, which we did in 2000, 2019. And, uh, and this is with uh, Yanis, who's here. And uh, I'll read out a little bit about it, what it is. Uh, basically, today we live in a world where every time we turn on our smartphones, we are inextricably tied by data, laws, and flowing bytes to different countries. A world in which digital platforms frame and mediate personal expressions and new kinds of currencies financial exchange and even labour by past corporations and governments uh, because technology is moving so fast a lot of the laws are taking so long to catch up uh, to even know how to pay people that are exploring this technology. Uh, simultaneously the same technologies increase uh, governmental surveillance powers and allow corporations to extract uh, ever more complex working arrangements and and, and do little to kind of slow the construction of actual walls along and actual labours, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. On the other hand, the agency of individuals and groups is starting to approach that of nation states. On the other, our mobility and hard-won rights are under threat at the same time. So what you've got at the moment is that people that are exploring technology are kind of finding new forms of liberation, but at the same time, there's new kinds of threats appearing, uh, not just for the artists, but for a lot of people. A uh, good example in China, uh, everyone is on being looked at by surveillance, just even they just, if they go in shops and in real time. And so, and that's kind of gonna happen now, although, in, in the UK, uh, I, think that they, I think they were going to do it, but they've just mucked it all up with Microsoft recently, so it might not happen for another 10 years in the UK. Uh, uh, so what tools do we need to understand this world? How can, we, how can art assist in envisioning and enacting other possible futures? Uh, this publication investigates uh, the new relationships between states, citizens, and the stateless made possible by emerging technologies. And that's kind of the context of the book. Uh, obviously, you have to read it to know more about it, but uh, that's the context. This is another book uh, that was released last year. Uh, and so, yeah, Frankenstein reanimated creation and technology in the 21st century. Uh, so I'll just read a bit of this, and uh, the front cover is by Carla Gannis, and it's uh, uh, the Garden of, uh, it's a version of the Garden of Unearthly Delights, and uh, by Bosch, you may recognise Bosch, uh, and, but it's uh, an emoji version, and this one's quite large, it's actually as big as this screen that you're looking at, and it's animated, uh, so it's, it's like a very high quality animated video, uh, but this is a still image of it, uh, well, a still image of a section of it. And uh, so 
Mary Shelley's gothic horror and science fiction novel, Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus, has inspired millions since it was published in 1818. Today we witness many different horrors and phantoms of our creation. Uh, chronic wealth and health inequalities, climate change, uh, democratic collapse, and the spectre of nuclear apocalypse are among the diffuse, monstrous products of our advanced technological moment. Frankenstein Reanimated presents a dynamic collection of artworks, essays, and conversations addressing surveillance, biohacking, uh, viruses, uh, colonialism, digital culture, and more. It retraces and contextualizes fr uh, free international art exhibitions exploring themes within Frankenstein and speculates on what Mary Shelley would think about the world today. Uh, collectively, the book offers a lens through which to look at our current situation and how art practices shape and are shaped by contemporary society as well as technology. Uh, Frankenstein Reanimated is perhaps the most powerful and engaging when it addresses the technology not as a tool or an expansion of the artist's themes, but as an agency in itself a growing chorus of techno objects that consistently ask us to drill the Arctic, build pipelines, burn coal. Uh, the monster does not feed us, uh, it wants us to feed it, otherwise it threatens. It will take its revenge. Those who serve and obey it can participate in its feeding frenzy. Uh, where the secret source of mimetic media meets the magic source of right-wing billionaires underwriting political campaigns to facilitate a wholesale move. To, this is someone else writing now. It's a, half, a move to the hard right. Uh, I think this is Amy Clark, who's in the book, and Phil Smith. Who, this is a five-star review bit from Amazon. And uh, this is actually quite a top-selling book at the moment, which was quite a surprise, like in Waterstones and lot in the uh, everywhere. And, uh, and it's quite accessible. It's got lots of artists talking about how they use technology. But imagine you're viewing the world through Mary Shelley's eyes today. That's kind of like 200 years later. She's looking through your eyes. Uh, this is uh, by uh, Mary Flanagan, and it's called Grace AI, which is an AI piece that was part in the exhibition. Uh, Children of Prometheus, and also, uh, also uh, here uh, in this space, and uh, no, and so what it says is: no matter the field, be it economic, political, or artistic uh, intelligence, and its intersection with the world, uh, there's an overwhelming dominance of males. Uh, indeed, in various emerging technology realms. Purely technical applications, artistic ones, it is women and people of colour who are left out of the conversation in the making. We will, and we'll show a little bit of it more of that as we go along. The structuring, the producing of the code especially, and the creations that AI can engender. Uh, bias, whether it emerges through uh, tags, inputting data, collections of data, or code itself, runs rampant in technical tools. Uh, Mary says, Mary Flanagan says, I'm inspired by Mary Shelley, the most influential inventor of speculative fiction. What's interesting about Mary Flanagan, she actually runs a games organisation called Tilt Factor as well, that does really well. Uh, so she's a kind of complete geek and she's written science fiction books and games books and an artist as well, so I thought I'd better mention that. And uh, so, and going back to what uh, Flanagan says, uh, Mary and a 200-year critique of technology, Frankenstein, her book critiques the Promethean fantasy of the Anthropocene, demonstrating the, the seduction of the possible and the narcissistic act of humans defying natural limitations. And, uh, has, and it has a, potentially a terrific consequence. Uh, none but those who have experienced and conceive of the enticements of science, uh, Shelley presciently wrote, 
but after the monster awakens, Frankenstein admits of his creation. I had desired it with an ardour uh, that far exceeded moderation, but now that I had finished, the beauty of the dream vanished. The breathless horror and disgust filled my heart. And that's from Frankenstein. Uh, so, and Mary Flanagan says, to engage with these ideas, I'm making an explicitly feminist AI. Most art history databases do not include gender or sex as a searchable aspect of the work. Thus, gathering the images has required scraping web resources, uh, artists by artist, typing in their name and culling images of women's artwork as opposed to photographs of women's artists or images made by male, male artists of them. Uh, and so, as you can see here, the irony is that she typed in, in her search, which is a GAN search, so it's like an adversar adversarial combination of two different mass images. One mass images of women artists and one mass images of Frankenstein on the internet. And she's combined them together to see who wins and Frankenstein wins. There's more Frankensteins on the internet than women artists. And that was quite interesting. And so, which makes you think. The next piece uh, is by Greta Lau, uh, an Australian German artist. And she did an, uh, an experiment with her child and uh, called They Learn, with AI, called They Learn Like Small Children. And uh, Greta says, uh, technologies often discuss AI in terms of human development, comparing the trial and error learning of neural networks to the explorations and learning patterns of children. But how does this comparison manipulate the discourse around so-called artificial intelligence? And what role do gender politics play between socially prescribed child-wearing responsibilities and the heavily male-based field of AI and R&D. They Learn Like Children is an ongoing series of large format textile banners made in collaboration with GAN, image generating AI and the artist child, trained on a data set of the five-year-old's drawings uh, and a second data set of stock photographs of children it can be said that the GAN has been taught to make images of children in the style of a child's drawings. Selected digital images from the GAN outputs are printed onto cotton linen over which excised graphic elements from the training set drawings are digitally machine embroidered. Uh, the series addresses interwoven human, machinic, and algorithmic creation and production. And all of the incumbent ethical considerations that uh, collaboration implies, as well as complex notions of authorship and originality between coded entities and codified relations, it directly challenges Silicon Valley narratives about so-called AI as they relate to the idea of intelligence and the presumed neutrality of technology. The idea that an AI is above or somehow outside of human emotions and biases. Uh, so taking an overtly feminist approach to work is interested in pulling the collective imagination of AI out of sci-fi or the sterile realm of supposed neutral uh, neutral algorithmic processes and into the messier world of domestic duties, uh, the politics of care and how these influence our hierarchies of meaning. And so uh, uh, Greta's disputing the relationship between AI technology as not just a metaphorical child uh, that's learning people's consciousness via the networks and the data sets, uh, and it's kind of like, almost like pretending to be a child, but it's not a child. 
And in a sense, she's challenging that kind of role model uh, that, uh, that a lot of these men are kind of uh, using as a kind of uh, pretend avatar so the machine can learn. But it's not a child, it's a machine that's learning uh, and not with a child mentality, as, as many of them have been saying. Um, so, and so she thought, OK, let's put it to task and see what that looks like. And so, in a sense, she's done lots of other works around this as well that's worth looking at. And uh, this is a, a recent uh, article about how artificial intelligence is going to change the world uh, in profound ways. And uh, in a way, uh, this article says that artists are like canaries in the gold mine where they're the ones that are at the front and all the damage that happens and all the problems, they're all being experienced firsthand because uh, the risks are being taken through that kind of real experimental level that asking questions are not being asked even by the technologists themselves or a lot of people that are just using AI for business, etc. Uh, because a lot of that technology and business is all about getting results but it's not about pulling things apart and looking at what's there. So uh, AI is not going to end humanity, but there are very real changes now, uh, from harmful bias in the data to excessive energy use. Misinformation and deep fakes are a huge problem, and urgent work is taking place to create, create markers to identify synthetic media created by computers. AI often generates falsehoods and anomalies. Until recently, the current tools could not depict human-like hands uh, with a full set of five fingers because hands are hard to represent statistically. It's the same with some faces uh, uh, in this exhibition uh, in, the, in the magazine, Unland magazine there. Uh, I was discussing earlier that some of the faces that it's been chasing, tracing back through uh, AI technology, you can't actually trace the faces, let alone the hands of some of the people that it's looking through, uh, which is quite uncanny. And uh, so this is a work of art that's been made with AI. And this is by Kasia Mulga, who's a media artist who's been working quite regularly uh, 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 with AI a lot, and she's done a lot of other stuff as well uh, on the blockchain. Uh, so Katja Mulga is using AI to bring her dad back to life uh, by convincingly recreating fragments of his personality to create an illusion of his presence. Uh, Katja travelled with her sailor father on the merchant navy vessels as a child, and uh, he passed away quite unexpectedly 15 years ago, leaving diaries from his journeys. And Katja has made a film in which she looks ahead to a personal journey uh, to find her father's soul in data from a life on the seas and reflects on the implications of resurrecting a person who is no longer with us. This is a really interesting way of using AI technology because a lot of data is collecting memories of people's lives online. So for instance, if, you're if you've been on Facebook for 10 years, for instance, a lot of your data <coughs> has been collected uh, also on Twitter and Google, etc. Uh, and you compile that all together, it has a uh, data set of you. Uh, it has a uh, shadow version of who you are, or a, uh, or a cyber body. And, uh, and I'm imagining what she's done is she's done that with her father and probably uploaded various uh, photographs and information as well and mixed it up and made the film. And, uh, uh, and so it's got that kind of a collage film of memories in her which I think is quite a, a very nice way of using AI. It seems very spiritual to me and uh, quite soulful. Uh, this piece is 
uh, a project called Lurem, and it's called Distrust Everything by Francesco de Abrivachol. I can't, my mouth's too dry. <laughs> mm. That's it. So Distrust Everything is a performative, immersive uh, AV installation uh, with a plot completely generated by AI and a soundscape created uh, by Acre. Uh, what happens when uh, ruptures uh, briefly reveal what is behind the veil of our reality, we will know the difference between dreams and reality. The interactive work explores the relationship between fiction and truth in the age of artificial intelligence for an aesthetic experience. Uh, it's worth looking at this work if you get the chance. Uh, and it challenges our perception of inner and outer landscapes. <coughs> the Italian musician and media artist and independent researcher uh, focuses on politics, representation and transmedial culture with the project. The REM, he works with AI systems and neural networks to investigate modern human computer interaction through text, images and sound. Uh, a lot of artists are kind of doing that because AI is really good for collecting that data, collecting sound, images and text, and you can even type in and even say sounds, and it's even replacing some music with new sounds uh, and copying versions. A lot of people that are in the music business are using AI to find the most popular music, so they don't have to make their own music anymore so they can get to the top of the charts. So there's all that kind of stuff as well. So it's really quite interesting what's being uh, occurring. Uh, these are quite well known. Uh, so Holly Herndon is the collective name of Holly Herndon and Matthew Dryhurst. And uh, they've been using kind of AI technology for a long time, but also engaged in kind of network culture, internet culture. Uh, they're kind of, uh, yeah, so uh, this is them looking at themselves on the internet through AI. So this is a painting that's been created by artificial intelligence of them that they've found by collecting lots of data of themselves. So, um, so th this isn't them painting themselves. This has been done by the internet, and which is quite interesting. So, if you're using AI, it's worth looking. So, in other words, it's it's if if you create a portrait of yourself, it'd be quite interesting to see what you look like on the internet, and uh, hopefully, I mean, uh, you could wonder whether you look attractive or thinner or I think he looks a little bit thinner actually so I'm not sure if he's slightly manipulated it but cut this bit out <laughs> so uh, but what I really want to talk about is what this what they've done called have I been trained and so uh, their tech is an artist and they've got a big following online so what they've created is uh, a critique of AI because so much data is being collected artist data as well as copywritten data into AI, it's all being sucked into it and being redistributed where companies are using it uh, without question. So they're using artists' works to make other artworks or they're using open source artwork that wasn't originally used for business or meant to be used for business, so they're bypassed in licenses. And so, and so this is uh, basically, uh, it's searching 5.8 billion images used to train a popular AI art models. Uh, 80 million images opted out of AI training. So what people have done is that they've put in information of their own artwork or projects so they can't be counted in within the AI technology that's on the internet. So their work won't be used to fill up the data sets. Uh, and so, so many illustrators, designers and photographers are furious that their work had been scraped from the internet to train an AI. Uh, last September, Matthew Dryhurst, an artist and academic, 
and experimental electronic artist Holly Herndon created Have I Been Trained. This tool lets you see if your images have been used and then requests that future AI models, models avoid them. In, uh, it, released, it recently became clear that this was more than a subversive art project when the CEO of the company behind Stable Diffusion, one of the most widely used AI image generators, gave people a March 3rd deadline to opt out using this uh, platform uh, as a tool. Millions of requests poured in, Dryhurst told, uh, yeah, as of this week, around 40, over 40,000 artists have been using this, and it's only been up a little while. So it gives you some idea of how many people out there don't want their stuff on the internet used by AI. Uh, this is a really interesting uh, article, AI and the American Smile. Hey, how AI uh, mis misrepresents culture for a facial expression. Uh, so the project raises some uncomfortable questions about the rapidly evolving world of AI content creation. Mainly, uh, is this the best way to bring uh, order to the wild west of image scraping? And also, if companies go along with these opt-outs, are they really the good guys or should they have avoided copyrighted images in the first place? Uh, so this is part of 18 images in the Reddit kind of slideshow and they all feature the same recurring composition uh, and facial expression. And uh, for some, this sequence of smiling faces, American white smiling faces, elicits a sense of warmth and joyousness, comprising a visual narrative of some sort of shared humanity, so long as one pays no attention to the incongruous of Spanish conquistadors smiling happily next to Aztec warriors. Uh, but what immediately jumped out, and this is not my text, this is the writer's text uh, of Jenka on Medium. Uh, what immediately jumped out at me whoops, uh, was that these AI generated images, uh, generated images were beaming a secret message hidden in plain sight. A uh, steganographic uh, stegana graphic, my voice is going again, a stenographic description with the pixels perfectly legible to your brain without conscious awareness that it's being conned. Like other AI hallucinations, these algorithmic extrusions were telling a made-up story with a straight face or, as the story turns out, with a lying smile. Uh, this confrontation with the culture clash of smiling for an Eastern European immigrant in America, it's close to home. This is why seeing the relentless parade of toothy, ahistorical, quintessentially American cheese smiles plastered on the faces of every civilization in the world across time and space was immediately jarring. It was as if the AI had cast 21st century Americans to put on different costumes and play the world's various cultures, which of course it had. And so this is some of the issues that becomes uh, Americanization of culture. There's another term that was brought out in the mid 90s called uh, American uh, uh, Californian ideology, which is very much kind of like uh, American Californian technology through the eyes of that technology, that's what's viewing the world. And that kind of, uh, we had an interesting talk here about how Cyprus language wasn't being uh, viewed correctly through AI. So it gets broken down and not accepted and gets filled in with American cliches. And so people's nationhoods 
get uh, dominated by a, a more powerful technology and nation state. Uh, so th that needs to obviously be reevaluated, and that in time may be reevaluated re with the more kind of critiques around the technology. And so, but until then, we're going to get these examples that represent people's culture, uh, that people are going to think actually accidentally it's a kind of fake representation. And uh, this is, an, uh, so I'm going to show you this publication by Dan McQuillan, who's kind of gone, he's, he's gone like full on against AI. Uh, I've kind of gone into AI and I'm, pull, I'm in there pulling it apart and having a look at, look at it. Uh, but he views it, he views it as a, a very much a kind of, uh, like, he sees it as, a, a, as fascistic. And, uh, and uh, so Dan McQuillan calls for us to resist AI as we know it and restructure it by prioritising the common good over al algorithmic optimization. He sets out an anti-fascist approach to AI that replaces exclusions with caring, per proposes people's councils as a way of restructuring AI through mutual aid and outlines new mechanisms that would adapt to change times by supporting collective freedom. So commentary that claims chat GBT is here to stay and we just need to learn to live with it are embracing the hopelessness of what, AI, of what I call uh, AI realism. The compulsion to show balance by always referring to AI's alleged potential for good should be dropped by acknowledging that the social benefits are still speculative and therefore it's still changeable. Uh, so in other words, the future is not written yet, but it's almost like AI is presuming it's written. Uh, at the same time, the harms have been empirically demonstrated as with OpenAI CEO says, we are all uh, stochastic patri uh, parrots like large language models, uh, statistical, statistical a statistical generation, generators of learned patterns that express nothing deeper, uh, a form of nihilism. Of course, the elites don't apply that to themselves, but just to the rest of us. And so, uh, and this is a kind of, he's kind of reflecting back to kind of data scraping, uh, like when you go on Google, you, uh, and in your, in AdWords in Google, they used to just always respond to what you write in your emails and send you adverts in response to those emails. And that's just one very simple example of how it's looking and what you're discussing. And uh, so in instance, if you've got, uh, I don't know, diabetes, and you're writing to a friend about diabetes, uh, what has happened is that search engine will find that and you'll start getting loads of advertisements around diabetes and where you, which you don't want to be reminded that you've got diabetes all the time and it's like you know and so you end up getting distracted from what you actually originally wanted to uh, talk about uh, with your friend uh, so the structural injustices and uh, supremacist perspectives layered into AI put it firmly on the path of eugenicist solutions uh, to social problems instead of uh, reactionary solutionism. Let us ask where the technologies are that people really need. Let us reclaim the idea of socially useful production of technological developments uh, that start from community needs. Uh, the post-COVID new normal has turned out to involve both a normalization of neural networks and a rise of necropolitics. Uh, so, transformer models and diffusion models are not creative but carceral. In other words, to explain what it means by carceral prison, and, uh, but it's a networked version of it. Uh, so, you're not actually experiencing prison, but it's a kind of that you're encased by a kind of uh, neptopticon. So, it used to be a panopticon which was a, uh, what's his name? 
uh, way a prison uh, where in the middle you the panopticon yeah where you can view all the prisoners and the, the, the security guard is right in the middle looking at all the prisoners uh, and that was invented in the 1800s in the UK in fact the Tate is built on one of them and actually a lot of the people that were sent off to Australia as slaves were killed and the Tate was built on top of it uh, by Tate and Lyle which is an interesting snippet of uh, history there so there's a kind of real really interesting history that comes back through the Panopticon then the Netopticon which is a network version of it and so that's kind of what was referred to to uh, where he's talking about castle and uh, they they in other forms of AI in prison our ability to imagine real alternatives because we've got no say in those alternatives there's a kind of hierarchy of alternatives through the actual AI representation rather than our own collectively uh, it's not so long ago that we all woke up to the identity of truly essential workers the people carrying out uh, the precaritized roles of nursing, teaching, caring, delivering and cleaning. The very professions who instead of being complicit and uh, with expensive toys running in carbon emitting data centers, we can focus instead of uh, censoring acti activities of care. So. The idea of care is only recently, the last couple of years since COVID has become much more significant. Uh, but I've been working with systems of care and uh, technologies of care uh, with communities for a while locally in Finsbury Park. Uh, well, not just me, Ruth Catlow and other people that we're working with. Uh, and other people have been working with networked versions of care as well. And one example is uh, Cassie Thornton, who's from Canada originally. And, uh, and basically, uh, she's created uh, something which is called a hologram. Now, it's not like the digital version of a hologram, where you see a hologram of something or a person or an object. It's uh, basically, it's a, uh, well, I'll explain it here. So it's an insurgency of sick artists uh, uh, organising to resist the global crisis of care uh, from bed and other the phone. In these days of compulsive overwork in a so-called creative economy, we're all sick, of our, uh, we're all sick artists uh, using ancient technologies of peer-to-peer -peer care grassroots health monitoring and diagnostic uh, system is emerging. Practice from beds and couches all over the world. Uh, participants co-produce a multi-dimensional image of each other's physical, psychological and social health. We call this image the hologram. In the hologram, Cassie Thornton puts forward a bold vision for revolutionary care, a viral peer-to-peer -peer feminist health network. The premise is simple. Three people, which make a triangle, meet regularly, uh, digitally or in person uh, to focus on the physical, mental and social health of a fourth, an individual, uh, which is the hologram. The hologram in turn uh, teaches the, the caregivers how to give and also receive care. Each member of the triangle becomes a hologram for another different triangle another time. So the system expands. And there's loads of holograms all over the world. Uh, a good example, Cassie went to uh, the UK to form a hologram with nurses and uh, uh, who uh, during COVID were suffering from stress, as you can imagine. And so they were all using the hologram to have time out so they can explore uh, the mental and social well-being of themselves together in a way that was mutual. Uh, so 
and it's unofficial, so it's not like a psychiatrist thing, and it doesn't play the role of a psychiatrist, and it doesn't offer the role of a psychiatrist. Uh, so drawing on, drawing on radical models de developed in the Greek solidarity clinics during a decade of crisis and directly aging with discussions around mutual aid and the coronavirus pandemic, the hologram develops the skills and relationships we desperately need uh, for anti-capitalist struggles. In other words, it doesn't need the framework, an official framework, uh, to define whether you accept it as mental health to be accepted in a network of official health. In other words, if you're just down the road and you want to meet a group of people uh, to mutually discuss well-being, you use this as a structure that helps you do that. And in a way, it's very similar to, because it's very kind of from a, a, a woman's perspective, uh, where uh, Francesca de Rimini discusses this with witchcraft in Europe, in uh, the Middle Ages, where they are finding their own groups uh, of self-care uh, before they were called witches. And, and where the men and the hierarchies of religion at that time, which were men, decided that this was a threat because they were creating their own social networks of care and they were killed for it and called witches. And uh, Francesca de Rimi does a really comprehensive uh, medieval study of this. Uh, it's called Caliban and the Witch, if anyone's interested. In. It's a brilliant book. Uh, and so uh, the hologram developed skills to, and relationships we desperately need uh, of the present uh, and the future. Uh, one part art, one part activism, and one part science fiction. The book offers the read, oh yeah, this bit's from the book about it, which I'm also in, <laughs> which is, uh, and it's called The Hologram. Uh, the book offers the reader a guide, or oh, the hologram offers the reader a guide to establishing uh, the hologram network and reflections on this cooperative working progress. Uh, a little while ago, I, uh, anyone can join the hologram, by the way, I created this open source peer-to-peer -peer resource of AI technology just before the coronavirus. Uh, this is what I did was work with many, uh, work with many kinds of people that are exploring AI technology like techies, uh, academics and artists around the world and I asked them come and uh, put onto this website open access all your studies in one place and uh, lo and behold like thousands of people responded and it was it turned out to be such a massive project and it was just me who had to compile all this data which I didn't expect, because I'd expect, oh, just 20 odd people would, would uh, respond to this. No, just loads. And so it's a really comprehensive, uh, comprehensive research tool for people that want to find out more about, who want to investigate AI technology. Uh, so it says they're created for cultural production of AI. Uh, loads of uh, students use this online because a lot of the data they can download free and accessible uh, and so they because some books are quite expensive uh, and some uh, anyway and uh, so it investigates various methods of computer vision artificial intelligence neuro robotics speech recognition generative writing generative music image manipulation and statistical modeling and so if anyone wants to find out anything about AI, about AI this is the place to come to because, because it's such an amazing resource and a lot of students are using it. It's going to be updated soon once uh, uh, I get the time. And this is, this is all going to be online. I, this is research materials uh, that I've been using that uh, a lot of this is kind of uh, 
relates to the talk that I've just done. Uh, there's some interesting uh, discussions around AI, like this one by uh, Zaron Lanier is a very recent article where he says there is no AI and there's ways of controlling the technology, but first we must stop mythologizing it. Uh, the article's really interesting and he was a really key person. He wrote a book called, uh, I, said, I think, I'm not, I'm not a Gadget, and that's quite a classic book. And he is a programmer that grew up in Silicon Valley and then moved on and really wrote critique about how, how people use the technology. Uh, loads of really interesting stuff here. And, uh, but more research material. These are publications. Um, so there's Frankenstein Reanim Reanimator, which you've already seen. Radical Friends, which is Ruth Catlow, who's part of Furtherfield, uh, who I belong to, and Penny Rafferty, where Radical Friends, Decentralised Autonomous Organisations. This is a, uh, well, it's a very popular book and it's sold out, it's going for another edition, and that's a collaboration with the Serpentine. In fact, both books are going through new editions, Frankenstein and Radical Friends. And the hologram feminist peer to peer for a post damic future also is doing really well. Uh, also, a brilliant book, which I just mentioned before I go, is AI Arts, Machine Visions and Warped Dreams. Uh, excellent book. And <clears throat> it doesn't just work with digital technology, it goes back in time to analog technology centuries that are based around algorithms. So it's really interesting about how algorithm culture has suddenly become digital now, but actually it started a while back, so it's worth, it really kind of, uh, uh, really kind of can, uh, what's so interesting about this is that technology and the way people use technology actually isn't new. It's just the way that it's affecting us now is new. But the actual ideas do come from before the internet existed. Another good example before I go is called Medieval Hacking, which I didn't put here, which I should have, which is an excellent book, which talks about how before the King James Bible, all the scribes would be writing their own versions of the Bible and like uh, menus of local foods in the sides of the scripts of the Bible, which was like a universal version around the UK of different towns, which actually spoke four or five different languages then. And uh, so it was really quite interesting. And uh, before the King James Bible came along and turned it into one British language. But before that language was actually a diverse language from Anglo-Saxon, French, etc., and Latin, uh, and blah, blah, blah. So, uh, so, and the interesting thing about the King James Bible, in a way, it became a universal voice uh, of Christianity, and uh, for the UK, that is, and, uh, and in a way, technology is kind of repeating that, but in its own way. Uh, so, thank you very much. And uh, that's me there, my site, my own site is called Turning Art into Real Life. And, uh, and also I'm with Furfield, and yeah, thank you.